Conservative Party uh, for being so tolerant of me throughout the time that we went through this referendum campaign. Uh, because I was one of the people who was not only a Remainer, but I was not a reluctant Remainer. I was a very passionate person who was very open and clear uh, that I felt that our interests were best served by being in the European Union. But we've had that argument now, and we've got to move forward from there. And the other message of thanks I want to say is, of course, we've had George Osborne here earlier today. And I think by going through this process that we've just been through, we now also need to just think back to what we managed to achieve before this referendum and we split on two sides of the argument. And what David Cameron and George Osborne have achieved in the time that they were in government means for me simply this. It means that my children will grow up without having to pay off the debts that Gordon Brown would have strangled them with had we not removed him as Prime Minister. Uh, and I am ever so grateful to them for doing that, and I want us to remember the huge achievements that they made, not just what has happened in the very recent past. Yes. Ben? Well. Now, moving on to uh, the actual issue that we're dealing with, uh, how are we now going to handle this uh, coming time. Well, to my mind, um, first of all, this is not a time for emotions at all. This is a time for very serious application of judgment. We have got to get this absolutely right, and we can get it right. I'm a firm believer in that. But it comes down to this. It comes down to process, both internal and external and that is why it is absolutely crucial that we must trust our constitutional processes and we must trust our parliament and parliamentarians based in Westminster to be empowered with making the decisions to deliver what the British people have voted for and we have nothing to be frightened of in allowing us to follow our normal constitutional processes to make sure that our elected representatives now deliver on that referendum result. And I know there was many people throughout the country who took the view that our MPs should not have a vote. Well, actually, we had that vote. And what is the net result of that vote? Our parliament arrived at the right decision that our executive must be empowered to trigger Article 50. We have nothing to be frightened of in trusting our MEPs, I'm com our MPs. I'm completely signed up to that. And in fact, I go one step further. I find it, as a Brit, I find it fundamentally wrong that I, as an MEP, am empowered with a vote on the final deal, but yet my MPs aren't. That can't be right. So therefore, please, uh, this is another thing I said throughout the time of the referendum, after the 23rd of June will come the 24th of June. And whatever the result is, we must absolutely, as a party, all come together. So please, let's all come together on this and make sure that our parliamentarians are properly empowered to deliver on this process. Now, moving on very quickly to the external aspects of the process, I see this as three stages. We have what we have at this moment in time, which is now, where we are in this situation where we have made a decision, but I do not believe we will actually have given a declaration of seriousness of intent of carrying out that decision, and unless and until we trigger Article 50. And therefore, we must do that. And it was always my view that that should be done in the first quarter of this year. And it looks as though we are on track to do that. So that's the first stage. Once we have triggered Article 50, of course, we then go into the second stage, which is the negotiations, to see what we are wanting to get out of this particular, in terms of um, final agreed deal. Now, a huge amount of pragmatism is going to be required during that particular process. 
but please rest assured your Conservative MEPs um, do have a role to play in that, and the vast majority of them are actually constructively <coughs> engaged in bringing about some of the pragmatism that is required, because they are the people who have got the links, the networks, the contacts, they know how the EU institutions work. They are in a place where uh, they are able not only to act as a bridge between London and Brussels, but actually to help uh, in rather tricky situations by providing that personal insight to unknot some of those tangles that may exist. And then we come to the third stage, which is the point at which we actually leave. What happens then? Well, I remain of the view, um, at that stage, we are going to need a transition process. Because at the point that we leave the European Union, of course, we must still be able to carry, in, uh, to carry on trade with the European Union. It's a huge market for us. But equally, at the same time, at that stage, we will not have finalized new free trade agreements. So we will need a period there where we can put in place new agreements whilst carrying on a trading arrangements with the EU before we get to a very final point where the new finalized free trade agreement with the European Union can come into effect. I'm sorry if I bored people because I'm telling you things that you may already know. Uh, in quite a lot of detail, but I just want to set out my own thinking in very clear <coughs> terms as to the basis upon which I will be dealing with this uh, in the coming months as we go forward. Thank you.